I'm Nancy Heitzig. I'm a professor of sociology and critical studies of race and ethnicity at St. Catherine University, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, my career really has been in studying race, class, gender, and social control, um, special attention to um, prison industrial complex and school to prison pipeline. Happy to be here with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for uh, joining us. And the um, so we're going to be talking about your uh, book, School to Prison Pipeline. And I guess, yep, there it is. There it is. <laughs> it was very good. Uh, I got a lot out of it. And I think the um, the first thing maybe you could just start by doing is kind of giving us an overview of what the, what you mean by School to Prison Pipeline. School to Prison Pipeline is a term that um, scholars and activists started using in the late 1990s. And um, increasingly, there are other names for it. Some have called it, um, you know, cradle the prison pipeline. Increasingly, scholars are um, calling it the school to prison nexus, this idea that it's a knotted up set of relationships rather than some straight funneling line. Um, but at any rate, the phenomenon, whatever we want to call it, refers to the increasing practice of indirectly or directly pushing students out of school and onto a pathway of interaction with police, juvenile justice, adults, criminal legal system. And one of the things that I was struck by immediately was the um, kind of the transition from, because in our, in our group, we've talked a lot about like slave codes and Jim Crow yeah. law, and then how it kind of, there's, there's a real through line from there to kind of what's going on in schools now, right? Yes, and um, let me talk a little bit about the, the bigger context, but certainly, um, um, the most profound impact of this is the racialized one, right? Um, that it is um, BIPOC students, especially black students, both boys and girls who are, you know, disproportionately overwhelmingly um, in these schools that are highly segregated by both race and class um, and that are disproportionately characterized by a police presence, um, well, a prison-like atmosphere of surveillance and cameras and, and metal detectors. Um, but yeah, it is part of this larger context of, you know, and th this series of them, right, is part of a 1619 project discussion. And, and yes, this is absolutely relevant to that. Um, school to prison pipeline, um, I think is one of the, outcomes um, of an increasingly punitive mood in our society, right? Um, you know, we start to see in the 1970s, the acceleration of um, incarceration. Um, we start to see, um, you know, war on drugs, um, which then morphs in many directions in terms of, you know, mandatory minimum sentencing, very harsh policies, um, pretty rapid and dramatic increase in the prison population. I mean, more than tenfold. There were 200,000 people in prison in 1970 and there's 2.3 million people in prison and in jail today. So that's a real explosive increase. Um, and of course that increase is, um, you know, heavily racialized. I mean, who is in, prison, um, extreme overrepresentation of African Americans in particular. They're 13% of our population. They represent 40% of those incarcerated. Um, you know, class also is intertwined with all of this. Almost everyone who ends up, you know, funneled through the criminal legal system was, you know, in poverty or unemployed at the time of their commitment offense. So, We've got this larger overlay of mass incarceration, punitive mindset, 
um, you know, that gets combined then with, you know, a neoliberal austerity regime, right? Where we only have money for military industrial complex or prison industrial complex that zero money for education or healthcare or housing um, or, you know, any kind of social welfare programming, you know? So that's the bigger context. And so if that's the larger mood, um, we shouldn't be surprised, I guess, that it's drifted down into the schools. You know, we first see it drifting into um, the juvenile justice system, you know, which that's its own long history, isn't it? Um, you know, juvenile justice as a separate legal system is created in, um, you know, early 20th century, early 1900s. Um, and it's meant to be rehabilitative, you know, the idea that Juveniles were not yet hardened criminals. They could be reformed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, 99 problems with that. And, and, that, and that's probably another conversation for another day. But we start to see um, a real hard move away from that, you know, in the 1980s, in the middle of our, you know, resurgence towards, um, you know, law and order. Um, so we see a legalistic, mood drift into the juvenile justice system where we see more and more kids and overwhelmingly, I mean, the racial disparities in the juvenile legal system are even greater than that in the adult system. Um, you know, but we start to see um, more and more juveniles being tried as adults. Um, we get this, all of this emerges in the rhetoric around, um, you know, the hysteria over crack, gangs, et cetera. So all of this is kind of paving the road for school to prison pipeline. Um, the initial impetus behind that legislatively is something called the Gun Free School Act of 1994. Um, and I mean, who's gonna be against the Gun Free School Act, right? I mean, that's, that's always also part of this problem, right? The sort of pleasant names, um, that we get pieces of legislation that make it difficult to oppose them, okay? Um, Gun-Free School Act said this, um, school districts, if you want your federal education money, you need to demonstrate that you have a zero tolerance policy for guns in school, um, you know, and so that anyone who turns up with a firearm at school needs to be suspended, um, well, and in fact, expelled for a year. Okay, um, it doesn't take long um, on the school district level for zero tolerance for guns to become zero tolerance for weapons, right? Which might be the Hello Kitty bubble gun, you know, it might be a Nerf gun, um, you know, it might be a little paring knife for your apple in your lunch pail, right? Um, zero tolerance for weapons. So what's a weapon? Zero tolerance for drugs. What's a drug? I um, you know, and then it, you know, bleeds into all kinds of zero tolerance for all kinds of other really, really misbehaviors, right? Childhood misbehaviors. So that's the beginning of the pipeline, right? Zero tolerance. Um, exclusionary disciplinary policies, as it's sometimes referred to. By the late 1990s, we get the other important piece of this, which is an increase in police officers in the school. You know, and this is partly in response to Columbine and some other infamous school shootings. Um, you know, the idea that if we increase a police presence at school, we could protect students. Um, and so from the late 90s, you know, onward, even to the present, we've seen a proliferation of police in schools. Sometimes they're called SROs, security resource officers, but they're almost always um, local police officers who've been hired by the school district to patrol the halls. You know, so those two policies lay the groundwork. I'll take a deep breath. Um, I, I guess one thing that I that that I should say right now is 
you know, the school to prison pipeline um, is not randomly distributed. Um, where, I'm sorry. Zero tolerance policies, um, a police and a security presence in school, um, you know, is overwhelmingly in inner city, quote unquote, urban schools, um, schools that are heavily segregated still, not just by race, but also by class. So, you know, we have these, you know, majority of students of color schools that are also majority poor and in the school district that, that gets measured by percentage of students who are eligible for you know, free lunch. Um, that's where it's happened. That's where the pipeline fl flows from. It's not from wealthy suburban districts, right? It's from city schools that are majority of student of color schools, majority of students who are poor. That fuels the pipeline. That's right. And I, the other thing I would like to touch on um, as kind of one of the uh, foundational aspects of this is kind of the um, criminalization of the black body. Yes. So like the, you talk about in the book, the black escalation effect, but also the fact that like children are seen usually as older and more dangerous. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a pretty substantial and um, highly depressing um, literature um, on the extent to which black children are not perceived as children at all, that they are um, considered to be older, um, considered to be miniature adults, um, considered to be dangerous, um, Probably the classic most well-known piece by this is um, The Essence of Innocence by Philip Adabagoff. I would really recommend his work, um, you know, that showed a number of different um, um, populations, whether it was police officers or teachers or college students were imagining that black children were, you know, three to five years older than they really were, you know? So if you're perceiving, uh, you know, eight-year-old child as a teenager, um, and you're also wound up um, all kinds of, you know, the long history, you know, that, 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 that goes back to the beginning of this country and has its roots in slavery. Um, these stereotypes of um, Black people as inherently dangerous, um, you know, you wind up those centuries of stereotypes, archetypes, really, um, you know, and attach them to these children, um, you know, and it's um, it's a tragic outcome. Okay. So who gets to be a child, right? Who gets to be innocent um, is also part of this conversation. Right, and yeah, that that struck me too. Is one of the things in the book you talk about is some of the little, little children being taken out in handcuffs and put in jail and charged with felonies and things like that. Yeah, I mean, one of the, when, when I first started hearing about school to prison pipeline, and I think when a lot of people even hear about it today, that somehow we're imagining that this is, you know, really happening with teenagers in the ninth grade or, you know, you know, Oh, no, I mean, the extent to which it is happening, well, even in pre-K, you know, we have children being expelled from um, preschool. Um, a lot of this is around children who are in elementary school. Um, you know, there's many horrible stories in the book, um, you know, that are, you know, children that are six, seven, eight, nine, um, handcuffed at school arrested at school, yeah. Charged yeah. frequently with things like disorderly conduct for, you know, disobeying a teacher. Right, yeah. things that uh, white children are usually given a second chance or diverted yes. into uh, what you call the medical and yes. treatment model. Mm -hmm. That's one of the other um, discussions in the book is, 
a discussion about who gets criminalized um, and who gets medicalized. Um, and then among children who are medicalized, who gets what label, you know, and there's a pretty substantial literature, you know, that indicates that if there are white children, white boys in particular, who are disrupting a classroom, they are much more likely than children of color to be medicalized. And they'll be given a diagnosis like ADHD, um, which is viewed as something that you can treat and cure. Um, one of the most insidious aspects, well, there's so many, um, but one of the insidious aspects of school to prison pipeline is the extent to which even when black children are medicalized, they're given very heavy, heavy um, heavily stigmatized labels in the medical model that are about um, perceived intellectual ability, um, you know, made up diagnoses like, you know, emotional behavioral disorder, which isn't even in the psychiatric manual. Um, but these are viewed as uh, immutable in a way, right? They are not easily treated with Ritalin or Adderall or we, or we can't fix it. Um, it's a foundational problematic um, effect, you know, and then if we start combining um, variables and we start looking at who is the most likely of all to be pushed out of school via the school to prison pipeline, it's black children who have a quote unquote disability label. Yeah, and yeah. I think you, yeah, one of the things that was really powerful about the kind of what you just said is, and you tie it in with the book again, that criminalization is a denial of education. Yes. And then also that the, um, the medical stigma that you just talked about is another way of instituting segregation in the schools. Yes, yes because um, the kind of labels that black children are more likely to get than white children are, are then labels that would lead them into special education um, classrooms or schools or um, some kind of individualized treatment plan um, that, yeah, that further segregates them even within the context of the public school system, yeah. So to kind of um, wrap things up is what can we do about it? The last chapter of the book offers some um, ideas. Um, I'm pausing because there's a lot to say here. Um, Certainly there's, the, there's the, um, the issue of policy change. Um, and we might be getting back towards some of that again, um, now under the, um, the Biden Department of Education. Um, one, of the, um, one of the policies um, of the Obama administration involved a um, joint effort on the part of the Department of Education and the Civil Rights Division, um, which began to treat school to prison pipeline and exclusionary discipline as the civil rights issue. Um, and the Department of Education um, under Obama administration had guidance for this about, you know, move away from zero tolerance. Um, you know, of course that was abandoned and um, you know, partly dismantled um, during the Trump administration. Um, you know, th there are some efforts now to bring some of that guidance back. Um, what hasn't been addressed by any administration is the question of police in the schools. You know, so short-term answer is sort of immediate thing. You know, it's get rid of zero tolerance policies try to replace those with some, um, you know, positive behavioral reinforcement programs, um, restorative justice circles, there's a lot of models. Um, and, and then I would say number two, remove police from the school because that really 
accelerated the pipeline and did it in a pretty dramatic way. The, the earlier indirect version of the pipeline was, you know, you were pushed out of school, you were expelled, then you get into other trouble. Now increasingly it's like you went to school and you were arrested at school. Um, so if we could get police out of the school, you know, that's, that's a big part of um, what I would suggest also. Um, you know, in the larger scheme of things, Schools need to be funded. Schools need to be resourced. Um, you know, would you mind if I read something actually from the from the oh, very sure. end of the last chapter? Because I think it sums it up. Let me see if I can find it. Sort of my last word on the subject. You know, because we can suggest specific policy changes, but I think it's a, it's a larger set of societal questions. Dismantling the school to prison pipeline necessitates a rethinking of the punishing state and privatizing ethos that has permeated all aspects of life. It requires a shift towards reinvestment in institutions that serve rather than deplete the public good. It requires an interrogation of the carceral state in all of its manifestations, including perhaps especially the school to prison pipeline. In the end, dismantling the school to prison pipeline will require us to attend to both the school and the prison, to confront the cloud of colorblind racism that shrouds them each. Ending the school to prison pipeline requires us to meet this challenge. And now I'm quoting Angela Davis, who's always a touchstone to me. Right? The most difficult and urgent challenge of today is that of creatively exploring new terrains of justice where the prison no longer serves as our major anchor. Yeah, it's very, uh, very profound. And that's a lot of work to do, I would say. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I mean, Fortunately, and you know, maybe you will have in your series on there is a, you know, there is a growing abolition movement, um, you know, and so I'm, you know, if you haven't already, I'm sure you'll have an abolitionist or two turn up along the way.